Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in tube lab number 133, we're going to talk a little bit about how to get started in vacuum tube electronics. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Well, Charles will be back today, and I've got a nice chicken dinner planned for him. But until he's back, I can't do any of the more complex videos in which we edit in live listening tests. And I've got a bunch of these planned for the weeks ahead. So today I thought maybe some of you are interested in learning a wee bit more about how vacuum tube circuits actually work. Now, building one of our kit amps will help a lot in two key areas. First, as, as we walk you through the, the build of the amp, we have a, you know, every kit amp has a build series in which you basically have a YouTube series and you can just follow along while we build kit number one. So we'll talk a little bit as we go about how the circuit actually works, what the parts are, and m more importantly, I think even than that, is we'll show you how things go together. And that's, that's actually really quite difficult, figuring out how components go together, because if, if you don't get the layout right, you can have, you can have a functioning circuit, but it's, it'll be noisy, or it might not even work properly. So that's important as well. But maybe you want to go deeper than that. Maybe you want to start doing your own design work. and Or maybe you just don't know anything at all about basic electronics. And you need somewhere to get started. So when I was younger, um, I had, you know, I started off in grade 9 science class. I had magazines that I would read every month, you know, I'd look forward to those magazines. They'd be filled full of interesting circuits and projects to build. And, uh, of course, we had kits back in the day. Heathkit was amazing. Um, I used to drool over <laughs> their annual catalog. And, um, in fact, the very first thing that I built was a Heathkit preamp. And I wish I still had it so I could show it to you. It was quite a m marvelous thing. It was really um, a good quality preamp. And, you know, back in the day, they were not cheap. And you still had to put it together. Anyways, we, I, we had all those resources. We had books. We had uh, publications. These days, though, um, we rely more on the Internet for a resource. And it can, you know, Googling a topic, especially a data sheet, is a great thing to do. It's, e it's easy. It's accessible. But a lot of the... Uh, in-depth knowledge is not on the internet. It predates it by decades. So um, having a little reference library can be a really useful thing. So let's just go through some books in my collection. Now, if you don't know anything about electronics um, and electricity, this Radio Shack standard publication Getting Started in Electronics by Forrest M. Mims III is an amazing, uh, you know, get-to-know electronics book. It's, it starts off right at the, very, at the basics. Let's just look at a couple of pages. And the great thing about this book is that there's an awful lot of pictorial drawings on how circuits actually work. And it, it's just really well explained. And it, it doesn't presume that you know anything. It starts at the basics. Later on, now this is a this is a book of the '70s, and um, there's there's a pictorial description of how an integrated circuit works. So a lot of this has got nothing to do with vacuum tubes, but the fundamentals of the electricity do. And those don't change, of course. So this, this I highly recommend if you don't know anything and you don't know where to get started. Now, a lot of books I'm going to show you, you're going to have to look for used. Now, none of the books I'm going to show you are rare. There were a lot of these published. People were grabbing these off of the shelves of uh, the bookshelf of Radio Shacks. 
around um, North America by the thousands, I'm sure, by the tens of thousands. Um, but what I use for used books is Abe Books Online. That's A-B-E, and Abe is amazing. It's a collection of, of used booksellers around the world, and you can often find pretty much anything that was commonly published at a price that's very reasonable and get it shipped in. Your local library might be able to help you, but a lot of these older reference books, um, libraries purged years ago. So maybe not so helpful libraries, but you can always stop in at your local library and see what they've got. Can't hurt. Um, if you were going to buy just one book about vacuum tube uh, electronics, Ed Urich's book, Vacuum Tube Amplifier Basics, wow, this, it's, this has got almost everything from the beginning to get you started and um, look for a later edition. I think mine is the, yeah, it's the fourth edition and um, he does, he, again, he doesn't presume you know anything. He'll show you how to read a resistor, read the code, the color code. Back in the day, I used to know this so well that I could just glance at a resistor and I know the value instantly in my head. It would just, I didn't even have to think about it. It would just, I don't, I don't even know how I did it. It would just pop up. But believe it or not, when I first started working in electronics, I didn't have a volt ohm meter. I couldn't afford one. <laughs> I had a soldering iron <laughs> and a bunch of magazines and, and a parts bin. Um, and um, as a result, you know, today I've lost the code. I can't, I don't remember the code. I mean, I know I can look at it and I can read a resistor if I have the code uh, key in front of me. But um, today I just take an ohm meter and I just measure my resistors to confirm my values. That's all. Anyways, uh, he shows you everything from the very beginning. The neat thing about uh, this book is that he actually does complete designs. Um, vacuum tube amplifier designs. He'll do a write-up on the circuit. He'll do a schematic. And, and he'll do, most importantly, he'll actually do a layout. Now, Yurik was an electrical technician. He worked in sound audio, I believe, for most of his life. So he really knew his stuff for audio layout. As I talked before, um, layout is really critical for low noise. Um, anyways, highly recommend this book. This is currently, I think, still in print, and I think you probably can find it on Amazon. Back in the day, this was this was one of the key publications. They came out every year. They were called the Receiving RCA Receiving Tube Manuals, and um, they weren't expensive, and they all followed the same basic format. This is one of the RC30 uh, was one of the manuals right in the middle of the heyday of tubes. Let's just focus up a little bit here, and they all follow the same basic format. So at the beginning. Let me see if we can find the beginning. There'll be sort of the technical side of things, how tubes worked, and um, this changed over the years, you know, as new inventions appeared, when TV appeared and started uh, taking over the electronics world from radios. You know, radios still existed, but uh, there was a lot more complication to uh, TV electronics. So these manuals would cover that. And, and more importantly, of course, they would have um, tube data sheets for all the brand new tubes that were come out. That's why these books were published annually, because so many tubes were being invented on a regular basis. Um, and technicians need to know what the specifications were. And at the back of these manuals, they're filled with information, but at the very back, there were actual circuit designs. Whoops. <laughs> That's one of the problems with books is you have to hang on to them. So this is a phono preamp. This is actually one of the very common um, passive circuits that RCA engineers designed. Um, and there'll be a write-up in the component list and everything. And a lot of uh, phono preamplifiers are based upon this initial work that was made years ago, 60 or more years ago. 
So these are not expensive. They're easy to find. Um, here's a really old one. I don't know what year it's from, but it's one of the early ones, RC14, and it was 35 cents. And look at this. I've got, let me see if I can focus that. There we go. We've got a name on the back and Room 101. So many of these ended up as sort of as textbooks in technical colleges. So having a bunch of these uh, on hand um, can be really useful. Now, this is not for beginners and unless you're really into the hobby uh, or working in the field you don't need to have this book but I thought it'd be fun to bring it out this is commonly just called the big red book <laughs> and I'll show you why it's a big red book <laughs> this is called the radio designers sorry radiotron designers handbook and it was written initially by a gentleman in Australia this is the fourth edition, but it was so important on the benches of every technician around the world that RCA, the Radio Corporation of America, reproduced and distributed probably most of the copies. I believe it was also published in Australia, but most of the copies that you'll find on benches and for sale will be probably the RCA version. It will be the same as the Australian one. Um, this goes deep. It's got lots of math. Maths that go beyond my uh, capabilities in some cases. Um, but basically any subject to do with audio uh, as it relates to electronics is talked about in here. And, um, and what some of these reference books will, will do is give you sort of a, a beginning point. Maybe you don't understand everything in here, but you know, back in the day, a mentor was so critical to learning this stuff. Now we have mentors online um, in Facebook groups, and they're all around the world. And in some ways, it's better because instead of having one or two mentors, you can have, you know, the world. Um, and I belong to quite a few Facebook groups. So if you're working on a problem or a design and you have a question, you go to your reference books first. Maybe you'll go to Google first, but then you go to your reference books so that you have as good an understanding of what you're trying to figure out as you can. And if you're stuck, you can put a question into a Facebook group and there's almost always somebody on there who will know the answer, who will be generous enough to explain it to you. Just, you know, when you put questions out on the internet, don't put 10 questions out at once. Put one question <laughs> and, you know, take a picture of the schematic that you're working on and post it with your question. Always focus. It's much better to focus. Uh, you know, back in the day, if I had a question for a mentor, um, I, would, I would bring, I'd bring the problem to him and we'd sit down and we'd look at it one problem at a time. One. <laughs> okay, well a lot of tubes came in. So let's just clear the big red book off and I'm just going to load this all up. So hopefully that'll help you sort of, you know, advance your interest if you're, if you want to get more into designing in electronics. So just hang on a second while I bring out the tubes. I've got some interesting stuff to show you. Some of these tubes are really tough to find. So it's well worth sort of celebrating when I do find them. Or I should say we, because Charles finds a lot of the really good to, good stuff. So as you may know, uh, Charles has recently gotten really big on the 6GU7 as a good viable replacement, a good sounding replacement, a good affordable sounding replacement for the 6SN7GTB. Now it needs an adapter. But um, a lot of 6SN7s have just become too expensive and uh, the adapters aren't that bad. And of course, once you have an adapter, you've got it, you know, for any 6SN, 6GU7. Anyways, we got a whole bunch of these in and they were labeled Amperex. And I thought, well, the Europeans didn't make the 6GU7. They didn't make an equivalent to it. Amperex, of course, is owned by Philips. Let's look at the box and see what it says. 
a North American Philips company, right? So Amprex was their North American division for selling tubes in the US and in Canada. So a lot of Philips tubes I get uh, are actually rebranded Amprex. Now, I was curious right away, what is in this wonderful Amprex box? Well, if you look at the tubes, now Charles is away. This is his specialty. And I could have just asked him and he would have looked at it and in a split second. He would have known, Dad, you see those dots? That is a GE. And I would say, yeah, okay, I see those dots. But how do you confirm? Well, we've got a real GE right here. In fact, we've got a whole bunch of them in the bin, but I've pulled one out just to show you how we would confirm. And so you can see here, can you see the plates? They're identical. So now the dots were really strong. Whenever you see those production codes, those dots, that's a strong indicator that almost certainly this was a GE manufactured tube. Now, oh, look at that. It's got the filament bridge. One of the reasons we both really love this tube is that they've got these bridges on the top. And GE made a lot of tubes with filament bridges. And they just glow beautifully. I mean, it doesn't affect the sound in any way that I'm aware of. They just look really cool. <laughs> and of course, a lot of us are into tubes because they're, you know, like they're sexy, I think. Sort of, kind of. Anyways, I digress. Okay, let's just put that aside. So, uh, so we did get a large lot of 6GU7s in to add to our inventory. And, um, and they're going out the door. I'm really chuffed. A lot of people are getting into them. And we're going to hopefully start to see some reviews coming back and see how people like them. Let's just zoom in a little bit more so you can see that up close. A whole bunch of these photons came in. We were talking about the 6SN7. Well, this is an early Soviet equivalent to the 6SN7 GTB. And if you take a look at it, it looks a lot like the early Slovenia bad boys, the 6SN7 GT. It's got the... Uh, it's got a foil getter at the bottom here with a large bit of waste chrome, right? The gettering. If you look right through the tube, you can probably see that big honking plate getter. Now, this is not an accident or a coincidence. Early Soviet tubes, the plants, were set up by companies like RCA in the early days of the Second World War so that the Soviets could make their own tubes uh, for war production requirements which, you know, was critical. Everything ran on tubes for, for uh, almost 100 years. The whole world ran on tubes, everything. If it was an electronic circuit, it probably had a vacuum tube in it, or many. I mean, the Apollo missions, they all ran on miniature vacuum tubes. Um, anyways, the great thing about these photons, these early ones, not the later ones so much. The later ones had the standard saucer cup getters. Um, but these early plate getters, this is from 1960. These are all, this early type is 1950s into the late 1960s. As I can still find them brand new, new old stock. And the wonderful thing is they tend to test really quite good. So high balanced numbers. So making up pairs of these is easy. And they sound really good. So for an everyday uh, affordable 6SN7, these photons, these, these rock. Um, this is, a, talking about Soviet era tubes, this is a really hard EL34 to find. This is an SED, Svetlana Electronic Devices. Electronic devices? Yeah, or electron devices. Anyways, there's the S um, logo, the SED logo. You would know this by its more famous logo, which is a winged C. But due to copyright issues, um, they ended up actually losing the rights to using it. So they went back to an, an older label, you know, the logo that they were using. Anyways, these Svetlana, true Svetlanas from St. Petersburg, are wonderful sounding EO 34s. I managed to find new old stock, new in the box, but I only found two pairs. And, and I don't have a quad in for, actually, no, that's not true. I do have a quad new old stock new in the box um, that I already had in the inventory. 
Anyways, these are testing really high, and there are amps that actually play in Class A, will play a pair of EL34s. So a couple of these are in the store. Here's a really interesting box. This is really looks like a mil-spec supply box, and that's what it probably is. You know, the contract number is up here. And this supplier, Calvert Electronics, Inc., and a date code from 969. Look at the box. It looks pretty much destroyed, doesn't it? But the tube survived, and it's a good thing because it's a lovely tube. Let me see if I can get the box open here. There's your label. And this, of course, is a Mullard XF2 EL34, the second series. And look at the chrome on the dome. This is actually the most chrome I've ever seen on any of the uh, new old stock uh, Mullard uh, EL34s. And, um, and we just had a big um, uh, XF2 sale. We were overstocked. You know, we'll go for months in which I find a couple of these, and then all of a sudden we get, we find a lot. And we got to the point where the bin was overflowing. So I had an overstock sale for a couple of weeks and we sold a lot of quads. An unbelievable number of the quads went out. And a lot of people got some really good discounts, uh, which I'm grateful for. They're expensive tubes. I know they're rare. They're hard to find. You know, we keep about a hundred or more in stock at any given point in time. And we need that many. If we're going to make up good, close matched um, quads, you need to have a lot of inventory. So it's a huge investment. But anyways, a lot of people got some great discounts. And of course, we've got a manufacturing code on here. Let me see if you can see it on camera. XF2, and then there's a B. That's Blackburn. That's where all the XF2s were made. And the next digit is a 9. So that could have been 1959, 69, or 79, right? But we know this series wasn't made in 59, and it wasn't made in 79. So we have confirmation. This is the original box. So it is, in fact, the tube from 1969. So I actually found a number of really nice XF2s. So the inventory, even though we got it down to reasonable levels, it's starting to build up again. Anyways, those are in the store. Um, and if you stayed this long, here's some discount codes to help you out. There's actually a secret code. There's actually a couple of secret codes. One that's easy to figure out, and a lot of you have. And it's been costing us money, but I'm glad to see people getting discounts. Times are tough for a lot of people. Then there's a huge discount code. One hidden code. If you, if you have a really large order, it'd be easy to figure out what it would be, right? Somebody actually guessed the code but didn't use it. So that doesn't count. So nobody's actually used the big code. Anyways, we've got flat rate shipping around the world of $20. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us. Stay safe, everybody. Have fun. This is Jim from Vowels and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.